For all of this, let me bring in the New York Times columnist, Tom Friedman. Tom, um, welcome. The first thing I want to ask you is we often don't think a lot about what the counter move uh, of the other side will be. So we've been waging this unprecedented war against Vladimir Putin. How do you think Putin is thinking about it? And what, do you, what, what is his most likely response? Is that we're already seeing some of them. Well, Fareed, uh, Putin's most likely response we've already seen, which is to, uh, I think, blow up that pipeline uh, uh, out of Russia that was providing natural gas uh, for Europe. Um, uh, in combination with our own, uh, as you noted, ban on um, imports from Russian oil. Uh, we're going to create a situation here where uh, a lot of European countries are going to have a very cold and uncomfortable winter, and gas and oil prices around the world will be extremely high. And I think that's basically Putin's Hail Mary, Fareed, where um, he's going to throw as many troops uh, into Ukraine uh, to hold the ground, hope that oil prices spike as high as possible in the winter, force people around the world to choose between heating and eating, and, um, and create pressure, he hopes, uh, for the Ukrainians to uh, cut a dirty deal with him. Uh, and when you think about this, this energy uh, uh, issue, you've also written on the, on the fact that the, at the heart of this problem, uh, we have not thought seriously about the transition to green technologies and underinvested in, in exploration for oil or natural gas. Is there a way to square the circle, to... F to to invest in these technologies so that we can have relatively low oil and gas prices and at the same time move to a green future? Free, we need a, a strategy that maximizes three things, our energy security, our economic security, and our climate security. The only way you're going to get that is if the Biden administration does something it has failed to do, uh, which is bring the leading oil and gas companies, executives around a table with um, the uh, leaders and advocates within the administration of our climate policy and come up with a solution that maximizes all three. Um, if, you, if you don't do that, we're basically telling the oil and gas companies, um, you're dinosaurs, please go off somewhere and quietly die after you give us a little more oil and gas to get through this winter. The message that sends to their investors is, hey, um, don't invest new money in oil and gas. Just raise your dividend, give me more of my return back, and buy back more of your stock. And that's what's been going on. So we underinvest in our own capacity. It means we can't make up for Russia's losses and prices go higher. We, we need to have an honest and true uh, discussion about this, and we're not. Um, uh, people are, are basically just assuming you can flip a switch um, and there's just so much virtue signaling around this kind of woke green energy that is just unrealistic. I'm as green as they come. I mean, I, I, I can't wait to you know, get off fossil fuels, but it's not something that's going to happen in the short term. And we've got to be realistic about it. And when you look at the Saudi uh, uh, situation, it just strikes me that, uh, you know, at the end of the day, what this rupture shows is this is a very fragile relationship. I, I've always felt America and Saudi Arabia are such different countries that it's very difficult to maintain this, this alliance when you have a rupture like this, because there's so much distrust between two very different systems. You know, it's exactly right, Fried. I mean, after 9-11, after the brutal murder of Khashoggi, um, the relations uh, between us and Saudi Arabia were already really shallow, uh, r really frail, basically. And um, uh, w we asked Saudi Arabia n to use its influence um, not to raise OPEC oil prices, uh, not to side with Putin, who wants prices to go high so he can get more money for pumping less oil. And the Saudis made a calculation based entirely on what they thought were their interests, their budgetary needs, um, and basically uh, told Biden to take a hike. And um, uh, I get it. Um, they've got that power. Um, uh, I don't think we're going to break relations with them in the short run. But Lord, how long are we going to have an energy policy that leaves us exposed, Fareed, to forcing our president to go to Saudi Arabia or anywhere else on bended knee to ask for more oil. We have to have a realistic policy. We have the ability to generate these resources on our own. We have to do it with a climate policy, but it's, it, we, we've waited too long. There has to be a coherent strategic approach to this and get over the whole progressive thing that we can't talk to oil companies. Um, uh, if, if the Biden administration doesn't 
get a coherent policy together, if the energy secretary has been completely missing in action, doesn't get the group together, we need to have a coherent policy that maximizes energy security, economic security, and climate security, we're going to be go begging for, you know, every six months for somebody else to fill in the gap. Um, let's talk about China, because I think that there is a big difference between the economic war being waged against Russia and the one against China. The China, uh, 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 these sanctions that have been announced, or the, these, these measures to restrict technology, they seem very targeted, very focused. They're only on the highest end uh, semiconductor chips. Uh, and so the effort here is not to wage a war against China, but to deny China access to the absolute cutting edge uh, of technology. It seems to me to make sense. What do you think? Yeah, I, I totally under, I understand why we're doing it, Fareed. Um, but this is, uh, uh, in terms of, of you know, U.S.-China relations, this is, this is quite a move. Um, and I, I just don't know where it ends. Um, let's begin with something very clear. China's president, Xi Jinping, uh, invited this move. You know, if you think about Xi and Putin together, um, we today have the two most all-powerful leaders um, in Russia has ever had since Stalin and China's had since Mao. The difference, though, is that when mm. Stalin misbehaved and Mao misbehaved, it was basically only Chinese they could hurt. But in the world we're in right now, in this wire world, now when the leaders of Russia and China go off the rails, behave in incredibly aggressive ways, uh, it, it affects the whole world. It touches all of us. Um, and, and there's no question that, that she is taking China, I think, in a very bad direction. So I understand where this is coming from entirely. That said, though, um, I don't know how China is going to react. You know, China, Fareed, um, controls uh, over 80 percent of all the world's rare earths that go into uh, your, your electric car battery. Are they going to now go tit for tat on that? I don't know. But once we get into this whole thing, we unravel the product of the 40 years of globalization between uh, us in China and us in the world. And those 40 years were, in your, you alluded to it in your, in your introduction, no great power war, uh, hundreds of millions of people came out of poverty, and interest rates and inflation were, were relatively low. You're going to miss that era when it's gone. And so, again, I have no sympathy with, with Xi. What he is, where he's taking China is backwards, in a wrong direction. But um, uh, I, I do think... We're, we're, we're just heading down a road where I don't know where it ends, and it's not going to be good, Fareed.